Earth. What a weird planet. With Catherine Williams from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we're going to look at Earth. What a weird planet. Exploring some of the odd facts which make our world such an odd place. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Catherine Williams, editor of Weird But True, World 2023 from National Geographic. Now, the most striking feature of the blue marble of planets is, well, it's blue. Very blue. So blue! Water covers roughly three quarters of the surface of our planet. And although we now suspect several other worlds of the solar system house vast oceans of water, none of these is found so readily across the surface. And, have you noticed the moon? It's in our planetary companion, it is a whopping one quarter of the size of Earth. Now that ratio is only outdone by Pluto and its largest moon, Aaron. But Pluto is no longer considered a full-fledged planet, so we win. Go Earth! <coughs> now, the moon was formed in an ancient collision between our fledgling planet and a, mo- and a Mars-sized impactor. Uh, now, once debris cooled and formed into some sort of coherent ball of rock, our planetary companion was much closer to us than it is today. And our world was also spinning much faster in the ancient solar system as well. A day once lasted a mere six hours. Now, tidal forces, mostly caused by the moon, continually pulled on oceans and land, slowing down the rotation of Earth, leading to longer days. This process also imparts some energy to the orbital motion of the moon, pushing it further away from the Earth at a rate of 3.78 centimeters, or one kitty hog-nosed bat per year. Roughly 600 million years from now, the last total solar eclipse ever will be seen from Earth. After that time, the moon will be too distant and appear too small to cover the face of the sun. So make sure any, you see any solar eclipse you can while they're still happening. Even the largest land masses of the world hold their secrets. An entire continent full of island chains, Greater Atria crashed into and slipped under the European continent more than 100 million years ago, where it still remains today. Now, Earth is also home to the most powerful magnetic fields in the inner solar system. This magnetic force protects life on our planet from potentially hazardous charged particles racing through space. And this field flips at random times with North and South Poles trading places and nobody's quite sure why that happens. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Catherine Williams, editor of Weird But True, World 2023 from National Geographic about the weirdest things on Earth. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by Catherine Williams. She is editor of Weird But True, World 2023 from National Geographic. Just out. Weird. So welcome to the show, Catherine. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, so first of all, just give us a little intro to the book, if you will. Tell us a little bit about it and some of your favorite weird things in there. Sure. Um, so this book is a basically a journey through uh, the world we live in. We go continent by continent in each chapter to bring you the weirdest stuff the world has to offer. So it's weird animals, weird places, weird events, uh, fun facts, stats about every continent. And at the end, we also have a chapter on sea and space. So our world and beyond um, weird stuff. There's tons of stuff uh in this book and it was hard to it's hard to pick my favorite weird things um but i will give you kind of a taste um Please. yeah so um so a sampling of diverse things that i really like so there's some really beautiful images in this book mm -hmm. um of places like i wish that i could go one of them there's a um a cave in mexico that is full of these gigantic crystals um mm. so they're 36 um feet long uh they've been forming for thousands of years underground um they they weigh 55 tons and as a children's book editor i have to translate all weights pretty much into their equivalent in uh african elephant weights so that's <laughs> nine nine african elephants <laughs> would weigh as much as one of these crystals in this cave. And part of why I like this entry so much in the book is that the photo that goes with it is so cool. It's like these these really giant crystals and there's a little spelunker on climbing on the crystal. So you can really yeah. see like how big they are. Um, so that is a really cool entry, really majestic. And um keeping with the majestic theme we also have something i like a lot uh, which is the world's most remote toilet it's a an outhouse that's just it's in siberia it's it's on a cliff near a weather uh, a weather station but uh i think that's a good example of like the different kinds of stuff you'll find in this book we've got majestic nature stuff and then just like kind of silly silly things that you can find in the world as well <laughs> that's so cool <laughs> Of course, it begs the question, if you're by the side of a cliff in Siberia, why do you need an outhouse? That's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> you need even more privacy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and how did you come into the project? What was your, what was your first hint and hints of this? Hints of um, this. this has been in development for like the idea has been kind of circulating for a long time in, in at National Geographic. So um, it, it really kind of like took a village to come up with the idea. And so we've been talking about it for years, but I really started working on it um, a year or two ago. It takes like about a year to make a book like this. Um, right. So I've been in it for a while, um, but we wanted to do, we have an almanac we put out every year and it's been like over a decade of creating this almanac. Our readers love it. So we wanted to come up with another idea that uh, we could put out every year for kids who want to collect our books who get really into this like one thing and so we thought oh well the world has a lot of content in it so um i think we've got enough to go off of so this is the first book uh, the first weird but true world book but we're planning to come out with a new one every year with new new stuff in it um weird news um and make it really current every year that's it's so cool and so what is it that you hope that kids get out of this book in this series of books? Yeah, I mean, I think the cool thing about Weird But True is that um, it's it's a great nonfiction book for kids who might be intimidated by, you know, your classic, uh, more serious nonfiction book, um, textbooks, or maybe they don't want to read fiction. Fiction is great, um, but some kids aren't as into it. So this book is a way to read nonfiction and learn um, that doesn't feel as much like learning. And I say kids because our target audience is middle school, but I learned so much from this book. And I really think most adults could really learn a ton from it as well. Um, so yeah, I think it, what we're looking for is a way to hook kids, get their attention and get them to read and learn about the world. And then after that, they can maybe find something in the book that they want to dive deeper into, learn more about. Maybe it gives them ideas about 
things that they could do in their future. They, you know, cool volcanoes and dinosaurs and things. Maybe that's something they want to learn about later. Um, and just learning about the world. I, I mean, I think helps kids care about it more and, and care about what happens to it. So I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of good to come of, you know, just getting kids excited about the weird stuff in the world. All right. And what is it that makes something weird, especially to a middle school kid? I know it's all hard. And that, that question is, it's, it's so good because I think about this a lot at work. It like keeps me mm -hmm. up at night. I'm like, how can I be the one who says what's weird and what's not? But that's kind of my job is to say, you know, oh, a writer sends me something and I'll say, that's not weird enough. I need something weirder. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's like very subjective. <laughs> and I was like, I'm the weird police. Um, <laughs> the weird police. Yeah, I love that's that. That's my so, job. <laughs> that's like an you know, early 80s new wave song. <laughs> it's not the weird penalties. That's if someone wrote a song about me. That's that's what it would be. Um, I think I drive writers crazy because they're like, this is this is as weird <laughs> as it gets. But um, yeah, I mean, for the age group, I don't know. It's it's a lot of the things are things that adults would think are weird, but sometimes kids are excited about things that I think adults might assume they're not interested in, like stats and figures and stuff. Hmm. Um, like that stuff that adults might, or your your typical adult might say, like I'm, oh, it's a number, I don't want to see that. Um, kids are still really excited about things, and they love to know, like every little detail of the things they're interested in like if they want to if they like dinosaurs they're going to learn every dinosaur out there and so um that gives a lot of room to play with getting really specific in our in our weird but true facts um and, and um getting some statistics in there but um also for middle school i love to add some like gross out factor too because mm -hmm. the kids love the icks and stuff like that all right all right um, and what, what's the appeal? What, what makes weird <laughs> so interesting? Is it I just that it's different or what, what is it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it like, it like shakes up what you think of the world as being. I think like on a big level, like that's why weird is so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. for example, one of my favorite facts, which I don't believe is in this book, but we've used it in other books. Um, is that dino? I'm not. I forget dinosaurs on my brain. Dolphins, um, they have names for themselves. Like they name, they have names like uh, in their language of clicks right. and sounds, they have their own um proper names. Um, mm. they have their own unique clicks, and I think that that on its own is a really interesting, weird fact. It's like, you know, but it also changes the way you think about the world, which I think a lot of us think of humans are the only, you know, creatures with sophisticated communication styles. And once, you know, dolphins give themselves names, then you kind of think, oh, well, what else don't we know about the way animals perceive the world, the way animals communicate? Um, so I, I don't know. It, I think a really good, weird fact can just kind of change your baseline of like what can even exist. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And you're talking about the writers sending you ideas for weird things and you being the weird police. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you decide what to what to bring in and what to leave out? Yeah, there's a lot of balancing. So like, um, so some of it is just like, oh, wow, that's a really cool fact. I love it. Um, and then other times, especially for a book like this, um, we wanted to, um, you have to balance like, okay, you can't have a book that's just weird facts about animals, just weird facts about, um, you know, one thing or another. We want to have a good diverse showing of things. And also we wanted to get um, weird stuff from like as many different countries in each continent as possible. Okay. So that's part of the, the decision process where part of my job is, is is just simply um noticing if we have like a lot of facts from one place or another and saying hey let's try to to mix it up a little bit hmm. Hmm. and you talked about engaging kids i love how things like this like just bring people in in general but especially kids but i'm wondering like how is it especially that weird things weird facts help engage kids and lead them to be able to look at some data some some numbers some statistics and 
help them go down the road, start down the road to science. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like a, it's a it's an attention thing. I I feel like too. I like there's so much competing for everyone's attention, especially now. Um, when there's so much content out there for everyone. Um, so like a, a something that's really weird, it just it can strike your attention. And and the way we have it or we try to do it is like we capture it with you know maybe a weird one sentence that's big and then there's more text below it and there's a big photo and so you flip the book open and you see a really weird image and you're like what is that animal and then it's, I've never seen anything like that and then you you get your attention and then you start reading it um, so I think a lot of the weird stuff is is also just about grabbing your attention and getting you sucked in and then once you're in you're in and you're gonna learn the name of every single dinosaur or shark or whatever it is mm -hmm. I remember being a kid and you know subscribing to Nat Geo World you know the, they had a little magazine that they mm. would that they would send you I have to say that you know that was really beneficial for me because long story short um, you know I grew up around the space program my dad worked on Apollo um, but these things were just great for um, expanding my view to dinosaurs, to weird archaeological ruins and and stuff. And so I'm curious if you ever hear directly from kids or maybe parents talking about how, how Nat Geo and some of the works you folks have done influence their kids. Yeah, I, 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 we do hear from parents and teachers and librarians that kids just like love our books and, and don't want to put them down, which is great to hear about nonfiction, which I do think, you know, people have a little bit of a, you know, they, they kind of avoid it sometimes, but also, um, I, I worked on a book, um, that came out in the spring, um, it's called No Boundaries, it's about, um female explorers and scientists and we we went into some really it's for an older audience and we went into some really niche career opportunities like um like uh explorers who like use drones to to image um archaeological sites and things and you've heard from kids like oh my goodness i want to be like a scientist who uses technology to explore like ancient sites and it's those things that like when I was a kid I, I don't know it's a lawyer doctor teacher which is all great careers but there is a lot more out there um and a lot a lot more places that people can put their passions and their interests so I, I have heard good things about that and it makes me feel good that's fabulous and so finally what's What's next for you? What are you working on now, Catherine? Well, I'm already working on the, the next annual edition of this book. So my whole life is this book. But I am also working on a lot of other things as well. Um, a lot of really cool um, kind of grab bag titles with different content in it. Um, I A book I worked on um, just came out this summer uh, about... Uh, cutting edge technology that's shaping the future. It's called Ultimate Book of the Future. And um, our author uh, did a lot of real research, like research on real things that are yeah. we, we think might influence the, the future. And we had a futurist kind of consult on the book. It was very cool. And it just came out. Yeah, um, we actually we had her on the show. Oh, cool. Weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So I edited that project great. and it was very it was it was one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, and I also do some humorous books that are a little less robust, but I'm, I'm working on a book about um, if animals text messaged each other and we're on the internet, what would they say? It's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, that's fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Catherine. It was great talking with you. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and that was Catherine Williams, editor of Weird But True, World 2023 from National Geographic. Weird, really weird. Go check it out. Now, life is an obvious oddity of Earth, but how weird can life get? Researchers investigating widespread deaths among a group of trees in Oregon found the responsible party, the largest life form ever discovered. 
an armorilia or honey mushroom stretching almost 10 square kilometers or 2,400 acres in size. Apparently there's a humongous fungus among us and it's thousands of years old. Even that Balthusian age, however, is easily outstripped by a meadow of Placidonia seagrass living off the coast of Spain, believed to be a hundred thousand years old. Weird. Now, the largest known crystals in the world are found in Mexico's Cave of Crystals, what a coincidence, where some single specimens reach nearly 10 meters in length. Yet this cave was only discovered on accident in, in 2000 by miners on the search for silver. Vietnam's Hang Song Dung Cave, the largest in the world, was first seen in 1991. Large enough to house a 747 jet inside its walls, the cave is home to its own rainforest. Weird. Really weird. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion as we look at Jupiter, king of the planets. We're going to once again be joined by astrophysicist Stephen King of UC Riverside. We're going to talk about his work exploring why the largest planet in our solar system is not accompanied by a magnificent set of rings. Make sure to join us starting on the 6th of September. If you enjoyed this episode, please download, share, comment, do all that good, good stuff, right? Visit us at the Cosmic Companion anytime and be weird with us. Clear skies.